Randy, welcome to the Soccer Queens podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. I was so looking forward to talking to you because literally everyone has told me to get you on and everyone just describes you as the hardest working one in the business. <laughs> why do you think people say that? Well, I, I don't know. I, and I don't know why people would tell you to have me on. I I, I hope that's a good sign. But, you know, I, I just... Um, I, I came, obviously, I'm, I'm older than you, and, and I've come from a, a generation of a family that just um, was hardworking. You know, my, my mom and dad, my mom finished high school, but didn't go to college. My dad didn't finish high school uh, and, you know, went to work, went into the military and started his own business with his brothers. And just from a very young age, I was, it was instilled in me that this is how you, you're successful is, is you work hard, you know, and, and, uh, I think that's something I've always believed in, uh, wherever I've been is that I might not be as good as some of the other people, but I always felt like it, it was no excuse for not trying to outwork them. It sounds like you come from just such a, a gritty background and it really just shows in your journey up to pit and you've had national experience. You've been at college programs where things were great and you're coming into an amazing program. But when you get to pit, things are a little bit different. So walk me through that arrival into that first season at pit. Yeah, I tell you, there's so much I could I, I could say on this. Maybe um, maybe for the, the people that are listening to understand a little bit, uh, let me back up just a little and, and, and tell you that, you know, I started my Division I journey at University of Tulsa back in the late 80s. Uh, and that was my first opportunity. And back then, in those days, a lot of us coaches coached both men and women. And that was, quite frankly, my first exposure to the women's game as a coach. I, I, earlier than that, I'd been coaching only on the boys' side and the men's side. Um, and so, both of those programs were in existence, but they were just, you know, okay. And, um, and then, you know, I think we made them both better and we got the men to the NCAA tournament and got the women right on the verge. We were a nationally ranked team. And of course, back then there weren't many women's programs playing. Um, and then I left there and went completely into the women's game to Baylor university. So I started a program from scratch. So that's, that's kind of a different dynamic than taking one over that's already you know, been in existence. And so I got the experience of how to, how to do that, you know, how to take a program from ground zero and, and build it. And within three years, we had them in the NCAAs and won the, the big 12. I think we were the first, uh, ironically, we were the first program at Baylor in any sport to win a big 12 championship was the women's soccer team. And that was back in the mid nineties. Um, and then I'd left from Baylor and went to Notre Dame. And of course, Notre Dame had already won a national championship. So now it's taking a program that's already quite good and making sure you don't screw it up, you know, and making sure that, that you try to to sustain it and maybe even keep it better. And I think we did that. You know, we went to, I was there 14 years and we went to eight final fours, uh, played in five national championship games and won two national championships. So I'd, I'd like to think we made it better. Um, and then from there, I went to the pros and had a stint, you know, down with the dash for a few years. And then when I got back into the college game, I knew I, I knew when I got in the pros, I loved coaching the athletes at the pro level. I just loved the commitment. I loved obviously the quality. We all want to coach at the highest level and work at the highest level. And all of that, I, I loved what I didn't like was the league was still in its infancy we just didn't have the things that you have at a college program. We didn't have a nutritionist. We didn't have a full-time strength coach. My staff, many people wouldn't know this, but my staff at the Dash were all volunteers. I didn't have paid staff. Um, so I just didn't like, you know, I didn't have an office. I can remember having to release players from trials on a park bench that was right there by our field. And it just wasn't wasn't professional, you know, and so I knew I wanted to get back in the college game. So that kind of takes me to Pitt. So I'm, I'm sorry to be a little bit long winded, but I think it puts it in perspective. And Pitt, I've got to be honest with you, Erica. Um, we had played when I was at Notre Dame, we had played against Pitt because they were in the old Big East Conference. Then we both moved into the ACC Conference together. And I never saw the campus because Pitt played 
in a park that was about 30 minutes away from camp. I don't even know what it is. I've been here five years. I don't know where that park is. But they played in an old polo ground, and it was an awful field. Um, you know, we would come in and play Pitt and then leave and go play West Virginia. So I never saw campus. And so if you would have asked me five years ago, Randy, could you ever see yourself at Pitt? I would have said, no way. I, I just, the program was terrible. The facility was terrible. Um, but then what happened is I saw when I was with the Dash and I started looking and knowing that I wanted to get back to the college game, I saw where Pitt had hired Jay Vitovich. And obviously he's one of the most successful men's college coaches, you know, many years at Wake and he had won a national championship. He did the same thing. He went to the pros. He left Wake and went to the pros. He was a little smarter. He only stayed a year instead of four. Uh, and then he got back and he, he came to Pitt. So I said, something had to have changed to get a coach of that quality at Pitt. And sure enough, when they called and asked if I was interested, I called Jay and spent a couple of hours with him on the phone, found out they had a brand new facility on the campus, um, new AD, a new chancellor, a new commitment to the Olympic sports. And um, so I came in and, 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 and took a look and I fell in love with what the vision was. Heather Like, I think is our athletic director. Um, I think she's fantastic. Um, she bought into the idea and the vision. And one of the things I can remember her telling me in the interview was I'd asked something about the budget and she said, I'm going to get you all that information, Randy. We'll, we'll get all that to you. Don't worry about that. We have a, a budget that's competitive in the ACC and you know, that part's fine. She said, but what I want you to do is you'll be one of our only coaches here, you and Jay that have won a national championship. And she said, so you need to tell me what you need to make this program successful because I'm tired of being bad in women's soccer. And so that's kind of sold me on it. The hardest part, I think, has been um, overcoming 20 years. You know, the program was 22 years old. They'd only had two winning seasons, never made playoffs, never made, you know, had any championships or anything along that line. Um so the hard part was was uh, with recruiting being two years in advance, you know, with our, our college women's uh, programs now. I knew I couldn't wait two years. I came in in 2018 and I said, I can't wait two years to get the players I need because that'll just be two more years of losing and nobody's going to want to come to a program that's losing. So I made the decision to kind of go out uh, internationally. So we brought in a handful of Canadians and we brought in – couple of kids from Spain and, and, um, you know, tried to turn it quickly that way. And I think that was probably the smartest thing we, we did, um, because we just couldn't wait. And, but that's been the challenge is really getting club coaches out there around the, the country, getting high school coaches, getting everybody to believe that we were going to be able to turn this around because they've gone through a handful of coaches and nobody's really, turned it you know nobody's turned the corner with it so I would hope that maybe some of my background and my resume made some of those coaches believe that hey you know we trust that Randy can do it I think that was a selling point to a lot of the recruits was based on my past history um, and then I think the fact that we're playing in the ACC you know uh, the best players want to play in the best conferences and obviously I think a lot of players looked at it and said well, they play in the ACC. Randy's got a pretty good track record of developing players and 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 building programs. Um, and I can probably go in and play right away. And so I think those were kind of our key selling points early. So it's been a challenge, but it's been a, a fun ride. And so far, I'm loving every minute of it. That's brilliant. And man, I have so many more questions about <laughs> your first season. So what were some of the first things you said to the girls and what was their morale or attitude at the time after coming off of so many years of not having a winning program? Yeah, great question. I, I think first and foremost, I have to say it this way, the play, I call them kids. They're not, they're not kids. They're young women, but the players that we had in the program, when we got in here in 2018, were great people. They were really good people, um, wanted to do well, you know, took pride in Pitt and, and all. Um, just quite frankly, a lot of them and most of them, in fact, just weren't ACC players. And um, 
you know, so that first year was, even though it was fun because you could see the excitement of a new coach and a new idea and you could see the energy. We got in here in January. Of course, back in 2018, we were still under the old rule of signing date was in February. So we really didn't have time to sign a bunch of new players. You know, we just pretty much inherited the team uh, that we inherited. And that first year we kind of went with that group. So 2018 to me was kind of a wash in terms of um, building because it was one of those that I knew we were going to have to bring in a bunch of new players and we we're going to have to encourage some players to think about what they wanted to do, whether they wanted to stay with us and, and try to fight through it and, and keep playing time or whether they felt like they wanted to go elsewhere and have an opportunity to play. Um, because obviously with where we were, we just, <clears throat> it wasn't acceptable. And that's why the previous coach was let go. So we had to, to had to improve it. It was a difficult year um, as far as results, because it was one of those, I think we scored in the ACC. We maybe scored three or four goals all year. We gave up about 50 goals. I think that first year we did not win a conference game. Um, so it was, as a coach, it was tough. Um, from the players' perspective, I think they enjoyed the change, but I think a lot of them saw, well, wait a minute, this is going to be very, very different. You know, I, I can remember going in the very first time we ran the yo-yo intermittent test, and I can remember coming in, and we were just setting it up, and our strength and conditioning coach was, you know, we were all dropping the cones and setting it up, and we literally, Erica, had players crying like crying. We hadn't even started the test and they're crying because they're so worried about the fitness test. And we had players yeah. dropping at level nine, you know, I think it starts at level five. Yeah. I mean, you're just, yep. it's like, it's almost a walk pace, you know? And, and then you have uh programs like UNC, their requirements are level 40 or above and you're not making it. <laughs> oh, oh, that's right. I mean, it, it yeah. was just like, but I think they saw, you know, we, we still had players that were under that mindset of, I'll train when we're training, but when we get to the end and we've got some fitness to do or some work to do, all of a sudden my hamstring sore or I've got to pull up and I'm, you know, and we made that really clear from the beginning, those kind of things, you know, weren't going to happen. And, and so I think um, a lot of them realized they probably needed to move on. So that first year was, it, it, it was tough. I, I, I've just got to, I've got to tell you the second year in 2019, I think we brought in 19, uh, 17 new freshmen and four transfer students. So we brought in 21 new players. And in that second year in 2019, we started nine freshmen uh, in all of our games. So, uh, but it was already starting to, to turn and quite different. And, and um, you know, but 2018, we, we still at the office, we still talk about that year a lot of, a lot of the difficulties we went, went through and, you know, a, a lot of uh, uh, things that those kids, you know, that it, it was just eye opening for them, uh, the changes that were going to be made. Uh, and for us, clearly, we saw that we were really going to have to to do things quickly. And, and it, you know, if we were going to have a chance of really getting this thing turned. But uh, it was so any coach that's out there that had to go through something like that, I, I certainly uh, have empathy for and, and understand it because it, it really wasn't an easy year. Um, the good thing about it is even with that group, I think a lot of the coaches that we played against said, Hey, we can, we can already see a change, even though we didn't win, you know, any games in conference and we only won one or two games more than they'd won in previous years. We still only won four or five games, I think in that first year. And, um, but I think we maximized and got out of that group, you know, what we could. And some of those players <clears throat> come back today and said, I, I, I wish we would have had you guys earlier, you know, in my career at Pitt. And, and made, so that as a coach always makes you feel um, feel good and makes you feel like you're doing things the right way. But there was a, a lot of a lot of changes that had to be made. And, you know, what I couldn't tell when we got here looking at the players I couldn't tell what the previous staff was trying to do. You know, usually you can, usually a coach is either I'm recruiting big, fast, athletic, 
kids. I'm not not really skillful, but you know, so maybe we're going to be more direct. And you can look at that athlete and, and and have a group of them and say, okay, I can see maybe they were trying to play maybe a little more direct. Or you've got teams that maybe are smaller but have more technical kids, and a lot of them. And you're going, okay, well maybe they're going to be a team that tries to keep the ball. But it, what we inherited was all over the map. We had big kids, fast kids, slow kids, out of shape kids. We had technical kids. We had some kids that couldn't juggle two or three times. So I, I couldn't grasp what was, what were they trying to do? How were they trying to play? And um, so it was really interesting to hear some of the stories about, you know, what had gone on previous to our time here. Wow. So you had a period of rebuilding and some some trials and tribulations but let's fast forward to this past season in 2022 and making it in the top 25 and well into playoffs what was the main difference with this squad well I think what happened it really goes back to probably 2019 with that recruiting class like I said we got in a few key Canadian kids like an Amanda West and an Anna Bout and some kids that have kind of been some um uh, some standard setters, you know, for our program, uh, you know, Amanda West is our all time broke has broken pretty much every offensive record that Pitt ever had um, while she's been here. And then 2020, we got obviously a better recruiting class. And then a 2021, it just got better. So we had three good recruiting classes. And I think in all honesty, I, I thought in 2021, um, we um, were good enough to make the NCAAs and we didn't. Um, 2020 was the first time we won 11 games. So that was the most any program had ever won at Pitt. Um, and so starting in 2020, we put together three back-to-back, you know, winning seasons and gotten better each of those last three years, uh, as well. So I think it was really the recruiting classes. We just got better and better. In fact, the interesting thing is, is when you build a program, those players that played a lot of minutes in 2019, those nine freshmen that played a lot of minutes in 2019 and maybe even in 2020, by 2021, even some of those players weren't playing as much as they had played early in their career because we got better. So having to manage those kind of issues or something that coaches have to deal with too. Um, But this year in 2021, we had, we had beaten NC state the last game of the season we finished ahead of them in the ACC standings, but they got into the NCAA tournament and we didn't. And and in fairness, probably deservedly so, although I thought we were good enough to get in, but they had beaten Carolina and Duke on one weekend. And obviously, as you know, those are two fantastic RPI wins. And, and so, um, you know, I, I thought we were good enough to get in, uh, but, you know, we just missed out in 2021. So this year in 2022, you know, a lot of people don't realize, but we had um, um, our one of our captains tore an ACL in preseason, uh, Chloe Minas, uh, who's a U-20 Canadian national team player and our starting uh, defensive center mid. So she's out and we haven't even kicked off yet, you know, and then we get four or five games into it and we lose Amanda West again to an ACL. Um and so now we've lost our leading scorer, you know, and and another captain. And and then we go a little deeper into October and we lost our starting right back to an injury against Carolina. So we went most of the season without two or three really key players uh, for us. And I think what what really happened, Erica, is we just we didn't talk about it, you know, with the team. I mean, when they went down, we didn't we didn't come out and say, Hey, you guys, you have to, now you've got to step up or you have to step up, you know, and, 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 and talk about, Hey, we can still do this without, we just made kind of a decision to just go. We showed up to practice the next day and just kept going, you know, with the players we had and we didn't talk about it to the team. Now we, you know, to the individual players that got hurt, obviously we were talking to them a lot about it and making sure they were in a good place mentally. Uh, but we really kind of just tried to send the message by the way we communicated that we believe in you and, hey, we've lost good players, but we have other good players, you know. And I think that probably in hindsight might have been one of the best things we did uh, because I think the players just thought 
hey, we're still okay. We've lost good players, but we're good. We can still do this. And we had a lot of players really step up. So the team chemistry was outstanding. Um, the team commitment to each other and to, to winning and not be, we didn't have anybody worried about who's, who's getting the accolades, who's, who's the leading scorer, or who's our best defender, you know, who's, I mean, it was really, it was really about the team and that's kind of what got us through. Um, it was interesting because I saw Eddie Redwanski from Clemson at the coaches convention. And that was one of the comments he made. He said, you know, you guys didn't have the talent that some of the other teams had through and through, but man, you guys had the best team. Your team just played hard for each other and fought for each other. And that's really, that's really what happened. And that was the success we had. And obviously making the NCAA for the first time, making the ACC tournament for the first time, um, you know, and uh, it, it was exciting and it was something that we had set as goals. Not really, we didn't really set the ACC tournament as a goal because it's harder to make the ACC tournament in some ways than it is to make the NCAA because we only take the top um, uh, six teams, you know, to the ACC tournament. Um but getting into the NCAAs for the first time and then actually making a deep run, you know, finishing to it, losing in the sweet 16 was, it was just an incredible year. Yeah. All around. That's awesome. And each season you just keep raising the standard and I'm sure everyone listening is curious. Well, what are the main qualities you are looking for in recruits to play at this level? Because a lot of female athletes are leaning in and listening right now. Yeah. Well, the number one thing is um, I think any coach should recruit to the style that they want to play. You know, um, I think if you just go out and recruit and try to get a good player here or there, but you don't really have a vision of how you want the game to look, then I think that's when you get into trouble and probably a little bit going back to talking about Pitt when we inherited not being able to tell what he was, what kind of player was he recruiting? I'm a coach. that's always very attack minded. I want to score goals. I'd like to win four, one or four, two instead of one Oh, <laughs> you know? So, because I think the game's fun and, and the objective is to put the ball in the back of the net. And I think players love to play in, a, in an attacking style. And so I'm always looking for, um, attack-minded players, even out of our defensive players. Um, doesn't mean we don't defend and we don't put a priority on defending, um, but I just think it's more fun to go forward than it is to just sit back and defend for 80 or 90 minutes, you know? And so with that, we want to keep the ball and we want to play an attractive brand. I want, it to look, I want the fans to look at it and go, hey, it – this this is attractive this is entertaining and because we're still trying to promote the women's game and i i think we have an obligation to make it entertaining and you know i look at it and i i kind of equate it this way you can you can try to play like a entertaining style like a man city or are you going to play a rough and tumble uh you know style like um you know, one of the championship teams plays or, or like Burnley used to play and that, now that's changing a little bit now, but um, you know, that kind of, and, and so that's, we're looking for technical players first. I want a soccer player that's proficient in their skill set. you know, that's comfortable having the ball at their feet that can play when they're under pressure, play when the spaces get tight. That first and foremost is what's going to catch my eye because that's, that's, that kind of a player is going to fit in our style. The second thing we look at is obviously uh, the athletic side, and, and and I know this is right up your 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 wheelhouse. Um, but we look in our conference. I think being the best conference in the country by far, uh, no other conference is getting nine, ten teams into the the NCAA tournament every year, and um, our conference is hyper athletic. So speed is important explosiveness is important, you know, a, a change of pace, a change of direction, agility, the ability to cover ground, those things become important. And it doesn't mean that every player that we recruit has to be a speed demon or has to be fast. But if you technically sound and you also have that attribute, it's a big bonus, you know, playing in our conference. If you're not the, if you don't have those athletic traits, um, it's hard sometimes to have success 
in our in our in our conference. Now, having said that, I think if you have a good team that can keep the ball, you can hide those deficiencies a little bit if you can dominate, you know, and control the game with your possession. So, you know, we've been able to do that um, in a lot of our games, uh, especially these last couple of years. We still run into these little mismatches at times if we get too stretched and the field gets too big. And now midfield player that maybe is not quite as athletic as the midfield player on Carolina or Florida State, then you'll have a little bit of, of trouble. Um, but I think sometimes a player's soccer IQ, their knowledge of the game can offset that, right? So I don't want the, the young players listening to think, hey, he'll only recruit you as if, if you're fast. It, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that's a bonus. Um, but I think the technical abilities, having some athleticism that you can cover some ground that you do at least have a explosive change of pace or direction. You don't have to be fast, but can you be quick in your first two or three steps? Um, and then speed obviously helps if you have it. So those are all qualities we look for, but I think some of that can be offset. If you've got a good soccer brain, you read the game well and you avoid getting in those situations where, you're getting in a speed mismatch, you know, especially for defenders. If you can read the game well, then sometimes you can offset that that long ball over the top where you're just going to be in a foot race, you know. So those are those would be some of the general qualities I'd say we really look for. Let's move on to the mental qualities. What are you looking for in recruits? Because it sounds like your squad now is very mentally resilient. They persevere. They handle adversity well. Are those some of the things you're also looking for to fit into who you have on the team? Yeah, we we do. I think that's I think that's a part of the um, of coaching that's probably one of the least parts we are aware of. Um, the physical side is kind of in that as well. You and I talked a little bit about that before we came on the podcast. Um, but the mental side is, is is difficult, and it's something that a lot of coaches, you don't really know how to measure it and, and how to address it and um, how to empower your athletes and give them confidence and build confidence and things like that. So when we're recruiting, you know, unfortunately, we don't get to spend in today's recruiting – as much time with each of the student athletes as we used to back when you were playing, you know, we, we could come into your home and visit you as a senior and have dinner and meet you, meet your family and learn more about you. And and now those things just aren't happening um, with the way recruiting is. So it's a hard thing to find out what really is inside that player, but we do a lot of homework with their club coaches, with their high school coaches, with opposing coaches, we try to do a lot of observations when we're out watching them play. And it's not just watching how they perform on the field, but watching how do they respond if the coach is yelling at them, you know, how do they respond if the team is losing, you know, um, it's easy to play well and be happy when you're on top, but how does that player respond when, when they need a goal to get back in the game? Are they one of those players that can, take it to another level and up their game can they can you see them encouraging others to do that right um how they respond even when they're substituted you know how all of those things i think become little things that we look for to see if we can see what's inside them um you know it's um i've always would rather have 11 players that are good players but have this mental toughness and this competitive side to them even if they're not quote the national team players or the top players in the country I'll take those kind of players all day long instead of having one or two prima donnas on the team that's all about them you know I think if I were a singles tennis coach I would take that prima donna every day of the week because I'm just dealing with that player but when you're in a team sport you know this the the willingness to fight and and be there for each other is so important. And if you've got one or two players, no matter how good they are, if they're not in it for the team and they're not bought in the way you want to play and it's all about themselves, it's hard to win in a team sport. So we really put a big priority on that. And when we have those kids in, we, we're pretty candid in our conversations. 
with that part of it and that expectation piece. And we let them know if that's not you, then this is probably not a good fit for you, you know? Um, so it's a hard thing to to look for, but we try it in every way we can to find those answers about those players mentally. And then once you get them, you got to build that, right? That's a part of player development. You know, you got to, how you address players, how you communicate with the players, um, you know, is a big part of building their, their confidence and, uh, or, or breaking confidence in that player. And you can, you can almost do more harm in that part than you can out on the training field, actually in the practice piece of it, you know, so you've got to be very, coaches have to be very careful of how they deal with players and every player's different. You know, some you can, you can be a little more direct and a little bit more firm with and others need a, an arm around them and, 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 and everything positive and, and building them up uh, constantly. And as a coach, you kind of got to know that about your players and, and learn what makes those players tick so you can help them grow in their game. Now I'm curious, this is a question I ask every college coach I talk to. And a few months ago I had the Hopkins staff on, and obviously that's a very different division and level, but they said that they don't necessarily always recruit ECNL. And I get this question from parents a lot. Do we have to play ECNL to play in the ACC or do we still have a chance? And I'm just really curious to know what your roster looks like in terms of leagues they played for in high school. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's another really good question. And I get that a lot too um, with recruits around the country. Look, the ECNL and the GA um, are two platforms that let us see kind of a majority of the better players out there. I wouldn't say all the best players are playing in one of those two leagues, but it is a location we can go to in one weekend and see a majority of the best players in, in the country. So certainly we recruit ECNL and we recruit the GA and, um, uh, and, and, and do a lot of it from there. So I, if I looked at my roster, I would say the majority probably come from one of those two platforms, but we're not beyond saying, um, kids that come into our ID camp. These first couple of years of building this program, a lot of the kids that we recruited that started this out in 2019 for us were kids that came to our ID camp. And we go, gosh, that kid wasn't, they they were playing for a USYS club or they were playing for another league. And we would not have seen those kids had they not been in our ID camp. So we're a little different with our ID camps. We keep them really small. We keep them to about 40 players max. and really try to uh, spend the time to get to know them while they're here. Um, we can evaluate them a lot more clearly than if I had a hundred kids, you know, I'm trying to look at in a day or two with an ID camp. So, um, and then we'll do the same with high schools. I mean, if we, you know, I don't go out too too much outside of the state looking at high schools, but we look in our area, we, you know, we will go to the high school games and, you know, we've come into a couple of our local players that were playing high school that weren't on a, you know, ECNL team or a, or a GA team that we brought in to help us build this a little bit. So I do think um, we're not married to that's We're only going to recruit those two platforms. But I would also say because because we can see more, you get more bang for your buck, obviously, you know, with the recruiting dollars that we spend it, it it makes more sense to go out to an ECL event over, you know, two or three days and spend money. And I can see, you know, a hundred kids versus me flying out to Texas to a high school game, you know, and spending Friday night watching one high school game. Um, So there's a financial side of that too, from a budget standpoint, that means um, that's where we, you know, that's kind of the way we do it. I will say this, I'm a big believer though, that, the country is so connected. Um, if you're a good player, I think you will be seen. Somebody knows of you and they'll find if you're that player in Montana that's, you know, kind of in a in an area that's an outlier and you, you, there's no GA or ECNL club near you and you just can only play where you play. Um, we, we, ha- we all have enough connections, you know, that we'll, we'll, odds are we'll stumble onto that good player. Um, if you're really recruiting hard and putting in the work to find those kind of players. And um, 
So I just think good players, you know, my advice to those young players would be whether you're in one of those platforms or not, keep sending your emails and your videos and self-promote yourself to the coaches. And, you know, I don't know any coach. I know I certainly wouldn't. If, if I get a video from a player that I like what I see on video, that's not in one of those two platforms, I'm going to make it a point to go see that player. So um, they don't have to, I guess, a long-winded answer. They don't have to play in one of those two platforms. Um, but I do think a lot of players come from those uh, at our level, at the ACC level. Thanks for clarifying that. And I, I really love what you said about your ID camps, about keeping it small to about 40 players. I've never heard that with a lot of the coaches I've talked to. Yeah. And most of them are usually like 100 kids. Yeah. And I think that's such a good opportunity for the local players near you who might not be on that ECNL or GA team, and they can just pop over to your camp and get yeah. really personal and get to know you. So that is great news. Now I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball for the okay. last question. Right. And you're, you seem really competitive and you like winning. And that kind of is the point of sports is to compete and have good records. But there's also this other side beyond the X's and O's. And I'm curious what you think the purpose of sports is. Yeah, great, great question. You know, my answer today is probably quite different than it would have been, you know, 30 years ago when I started. Um, as a young coach, um, when I started out coaching and having these ambitions of, you know, I started out as a high school coach because back in my day, um, the clubs weren't, we didn't have the club soccer. And the only way to really make a living if you wanted to coach was either high school or college. And so when I started my career, that was in high school. And so my dream was I always had a goal. I wanted to be a college coach. And then when I got into college, I wanted to coach for a national team. And then when the pro leagues came around, I want to coach for a pro team. And, you know, those kinds of things were goals that I had that continued to drive me. So early on, I think if you would ask me that question, my answer would have been, Hey, it's about winning games and being a successful coach. That's how I climbed the ladder, right? Hey, he's a good high school coach. Well, let's give him a college job. He's a good college coach. He's successful there. Let's get him to the. So I was driven, mistakenly, I was driven about winning. And honestly, if I, if I were to be honest with you and myself and the listeners out there, in those early years of coaching, I absolutely made great relationships with the players that I had coached and I stay in touch with a lot of those kids that played for me in high school. And, and so I was always good about the relationship building piece of it, but my focus was really on, on winning. And then as I got older, I started to realize, you know, there's, there's so much more to this than just winning games. And I, and I, I as I matured and I, I, I came to realize that when I leave this, I don't want to be remembered just for being a successful coach. I want the players that played for me to remember me for, hey, he he helped me become a better person. He helped me come from a dark place to a to a good place. He he helped prepare me for life after college, you know, for all those things that become important. I get more enjoyment now on Facebook and social media seeing the players that played for me seeing what they're doing, seeing them have kids now and raising their families. Like I said this the other day, and I, I don't think the person I was talking to really believed me, but I really mean this. Look, I love winning. I remember very clearly winning the national championship in 2004. Uh, I remember a lot about the game. I remember that in 2010. I'll never forget that moment. But what I found after winning those national championships was like the next day, it was kind of like, okay, we won. And there's still a little bit of accolades, you know, a little bit of a few days afterwards, you know, some residual congratulations and things. But then I realized that doesn't, I got to go back to work. That doesn't change. Like, okay, I'll, you won it, but it's not going to help me win it in 2005 or in 2011, you know, that. so I realized I had to go back to work. And then I realized from there is, is that, as much as I enjoyed those moments, I really enjoy more now seeing what my players are doing 
with their lives and seeing how they're changing the world. Some of them stayed in the game and are giving back to the game. And I love seeing that. Some of them moved on with their degree and are doing, I've got firefighters to lawyers, to doctors, to all kinds of players that played for me doing life-changing things, you know, in, in this world, which we, we all know we need. Um, so I really do get more enjoyment out of that. Now, doesn't mean I don't want to win again. Doesn't mean I don't want to win another national championship because we do. I'm still every bit driven there. But the purpose to me now um, is not about winning championship. It's really about developing the individual player to become, to maximize and get what they can out of their athletic career, but then to set them up for the next 40 years of their life, you know, to prepare them for what's ahead of that. And that's, that's kind of why my answer is so different today than it would have been as a, as a young coach. I love that, Randy. And I'm just like, dang, I want to play for you, <laughs> but I'm too old <laughs> I wish for that you could now. Have. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and you know, I'm sure the people listening are really inspired by that and they're going to follow you as they should. I look at your Twitter every day and I just see a motivational quote and I'm just so fired up for my yeah. day. And I just, I think you should just keep sharing and we're excited to see what happens in the coming season. So where can everyone find you on Twitter? Well, it's just at, uh, coach Waldrum and, um, they can find me there. Unfortunately, I still haven't figured out the Instagram thing yet. So I'm not on Instagram. I probably ought to do that. Um, no, you but, don't need to. Twitter's good. <laughs> it's right. yeah, but definitely uh, at Coach Waldrum. Yeah, I'd love to love to connect. And, and um, you know, to you too, we, we've got to do this again, because one day I'd like to pick your brain a little on this podcast. And let's dive into some of the the, the the fitness mistakes that we made over the years and what we've learned and what I think that would be a real beneficial conversation for a lot of college and, and youth coaches Ooh. out there. I'm uh, going to file that one away because yeah. that is a good one. All the stupid things us coaches used to do in the early 2000s. Well, yeah. for you earlier than that, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> I was in high right. school. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I, I think that's such a big part today, um, you know, of, 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 of now what we know and how we should be training and how we, you know, we should be concerned about the loading and, and all of that. I think that would be a, a great conversation. And I'd love to hear your insights on some of that myself. So if you ever want to do this again, let's, let's do it. And let's have some, let's have some good conversation about that piece as well. I would love that. And I do have a lot of repeat guests on, so I'm sure you'll be back and I'm sure everyone else will want you to come back. So thank you again for, for this great discussion and everyone listening. We appreciate you tuning in and we'll see you on next week's episode.